They want to have that money put away for like one or two lifetimes more than the kid's age before they can touch it again. So the only rational approach for a child of that age is to spend the money as fast as they can before it's confiscated by the fiscal authorities. And so you take that perspective from the child and David Owen says you have to, you the parent, have to get used to the thought of giving them a $20 bill and having them light it on fire and run around the yard like it's a 4th of July sparkler. You mentioned the cost of raising a child, and the, we, we look at it as the opportunity cost of failing to raise a financially literate child. And the thing that I found fascinating, and my wife did too when I talked to her about it, was you don't teach your kids how to save first. You teach them how to spend first. And that's the way you start, which I thought was, I'm a spendthrift, and why shouldn't I learn to save first? But you have to learn to spend before you can learn to save, and that's part of the odyssey. I would rather watch her make a mistake with a $5 bill when she's five years old than I'd rather watch her make a mistake with a $50 bill when she's a teenager than to watch her make a $5,000 mistake in college or a $50,000 mistake with their 401k. And so you're going to burn a lot of money on a five, six, seven year old to get them to learn how to manage money. And when I say a lot of money, I mean, maybe it's a, a week's wages uh, for a parent over several years. Welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, and life for late starters of any age on their journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're going to talk to experts, other late starters, and explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to Fi together. Hello, and welcome back to Catching Up to Fi. I'm Bill Yount with my co-host, Becky Heptig. And we have guests in, well, Phoenix and Houston and Hawaii today. <laughs> We're all over the place, all over the world. It's very exciting to invite and have guests that here, Doug Nordman and Carol Pittner, who wrote a book that we want to go over today. Becky, I'm just excited about this conversation because this is a bit different for us. We've never interviewed two people at the same time. That's true. That's true. It's getting crowded in here. <laughs> so, But this is going to be fun. It's kind of like a submarine, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> this is going right. to be fun. Well, th this could be a long one as we generously are. So let's just jump in and introduce Doug Nordman and Carol Pittner. I'll take Doug, you take Carol, Becky. All right. and let's tell our audience a little bit about who they are and just in case they don't know. So Doug may not remember it, but I first met Doug at FinCon 2019. He's a fixture at the entrances to these conferences where he hangs out, meeting old friends and making new ones as the unofficial FinCon greeter. Nords, as he's fondly known, is a seasoned veteran, pun intended, of the FI community. In fact, I had to coin a new acronym for him and his generation, Old Spice Fi. I don't know if you guys remember the Old Spice commercials. It may tell us what generation we are. But Old Spice Fi, you heard it here first. That's Doug. And Carol's probably New Spice Fi. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm anyway. from that Spice Girls generation, so that works out beautifully. Yes. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Nords joined the submarine force right out of the Naval Academy in 1982 and served our country in the arena for 20 years. He's passionate about helping everyone reach financial independence, but is especially passionate about helping veterans do so. Surprisingly, very few military service members reach financial independence during their time in uniform, and Doug is trying to change that. He's a longtime blogger at militaryfinancialindependence.com and an accomplished author of The Military Guide to Financial Independence and Retirement, as well as co-author with his daughter, Carol, of the book we are discussing here today, Raising Your Money Savvy Family for Next Generation Financial Independence. All of his writing revenue is donated to military charities. He just enjoys paying it forward. So Norris retired from active duty in 2002 at the age of 41. His wife, that's when a lot of us woke up to FI and started. So we're going to try and get Nord's recommendations on how we catch up to FI. Mm -hmm. His wife, Marge, transferred from active duty in the Navy to the Naval Reserve in 2001 and retired as well in 2008. They have a daughter, Carol, there on the camera that you see today. And we encourage people to go to our YouTube channel so that you can experience uh, the visual side of these podcasts. Mm -hmm. Today, Doug is an omnivorous reader a martial arts student, a veteran of many chaotic home improvement projects, 
and a doting grandfather now. If you can't find him at home, he's probably surfing. If you visit him, he's known for offering you a surfing lesson on Carol's high school graduation present <laughs> surfboard, right? Awesome. Absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> And and I have recently booked a trip to Hawaii for 2025, Doug. So yes, I'm I'm looking forward to these surfing lessons. <laughs> All right, so start Carol, start swimming. Start swimming. <laughs> so Carol Pittner was born and raised in Hawaii. She attended Rice University on an ROTC scholarship and graduated with a BS degree in civil engineering. She then joined the U.S. Navy. Carol sailed thousands of miles around the world on multiple ships as a surface warfare officer. Now at home again, and also in the Navy Reserves, Carol and her spouse, who is on active duty in the Navy, are rapidly approaching financial independence on a high savings rate. They have started their own family and have a toddler. Carol now also serves the military community as a lead planner at Redeployment Wealth Strategies and is pursuing academic courses in financial planning. As our listeners will see, personal finance has always been an important family topic, almost as important <laughs> as surfing. She and her husband have happily recently moved back to Hawaii. In a slick arbitrage move, I don't think they live very far from Nords and Marge. I'll wager their daughter has already been on a surfboard too. So, Doug and Carol, welcome to Catching Up to Fi. I have to tell you, I'm so jealous about you guys living in the same town. I've asked Stephen multiple times, is there any way that you can get an assignment at the Air Force Academy? And no, right. it's not going to happen. <laughs> There's a, a really good episode of Everybody Loves Raymond. I think it's actually the pilot where they're in the apartment and they're just trying to decide where they're going to live in the suburbs. And he starts talking about the hot zone. You want to make sure that you're not so close that they're visiting every day, but they're also not so far away that they're going to stay overnight. So you want to be in the hot zone. <laughs> That's right. Or in the hot zone. <laughs> <laughs> nice, well, nice. Our, our, our granddaughter, though, she thinks she lives in both places. They're both equally <laughs> yeah. hers to uh, come whenever she wants. Absolutely. It takes her about 15 minutes to get between the two locations, give or take how many cats there are to pet along the way. That's right. <laughs> oh, okay. Are you biking between locations? Not yeah. yet. She's on a bicycle, but she's not very straightforward with the bicycle. So. She's She's got the going part all figured out. It's the stopping part that really needs some work here. And it's all and, down and hill. Turning. Yeah, turning. Yeah. Okay, turning. Kind turning of, would be oh nice, too. Not into the rough walls. That sounds like me on the scooter in Bali. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I had a close encounter with a rock wall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. We're looking forward to many of those. I mean, and they've only been here, what, two weeks? Two weeks. Early two weeks, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's wow. exciting. I mean, was this intentional or unintentional with the assignment in Hawaii? <laughs> it, it was both. It was one day we realized that one of the best assignments for my husband to take was probably going to be in Hawaii, but that one day meant that that assignment would be maybe five years from now. And so it was step by step year by year, duty station by duty station to get there. If at first you don't succeed with the assignment officer, then keep trying and maybe you'll get it on the second set of orders, a couple mm -hmm. of years behind your anticipated plan, but at least you'll get it. Mm -hmm. All right, and, and has your daughter been on a surfboard already? She has. She's uh, not she the most fond of the it. ocean yet. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll have to uh, see if she'll watch more Lilo and Stitch, maybe enjoy some Moana first. Maybe we'll actually get a little motivation from there. I, I've taught a lot of kids to surf, and the youngest ever has been six and a half, seven years old. And so I think their sweet spot is more like eight, nine, ten years old. We, we've got plenty of time. She's living in a state where you probably have to have a, a surfboard before you can get your driver's license. So I think this should work out just fine. <laughs> nice. Of course. All right. Well, do you still have the ski mobile? There was a Prius in your past that uh, was the, is that still exists? The, the, the first Prius? We got 13 years out of it, and it had a failure of a dis dashboard display. It's a very expensive repair. It's one of those repairs that you look at on YouTube and looks really, really easy until you start breaking all the brittle plastic in a, in a car that old. Oh. Today, we're both driving electric vehicles. My wife and I are both driving Nissan Leafs, and we have a, a solar array, a photovoltaic array on our roof. So free gas, right? We're recharging the vehicles for free from our uh, solar array, and we love them. EVs. On a tiny little island like this, 30 by 40 mile island, electric vehicles are the easiest way to get around for cheap. 
and we really enjoy the lifestyle. Yeah, well, you've got to start another acronym called GreenFi because you're a big proponent <laughs> of exactly green right. Yeah. yeah, being green before it was cool. Yeah, and being fi is actually very green, right? It's it, it's best for the world to be financially savvy, right? I'll, I'll point out that people feel that if you're being green, that means you're actually uh, experiencing deprivation. But you're recycling your own toilet paper and you're dumpster diving for food and. That's not the whole point of financial independence. We just like the sustainability and, and being frugal and, and being green means that it's challenging and fulfilling and you don't feel like you're struggling. In fact, you feel like you're winning, right? Right, and yeah. the other side of that was that on most military bases, especially for someone like me who was starting out as a young officer that really didn't have any status or qualifications whatsoever, you don't get any <laughs> privileges whatsoever when it comes to parking spots. So you're lucky if you're parked within a mile of where you're gonna be working. And good luck with any snow or rain or other obstacles that may be in your way. And so I figured out pretty quickly in the Navy that for some reason, everyone puts the bicycle racks right in front of the building and all the cars are set a mile away from the building. So the way to get the better parking spot was to switch from gas to pedal power. And all of a sudden things got so much easier. You can bicycle <laughs> to work faster than you can drive to work. Oh, I, I had this whole day where I got to my ship and they have showers on board and locker rooms all on board. So I'm changing my uniform. I have my morning cup of black tea. I'm sitting comfortably on my computer, checking my email. And my E7 chief comes in and he just bangs the door open and he's just standing in the frame and he's got eyes locked on me like I'm in trouble. <laughs> I said, oh no, what did I do this time chief? And he says, ma'am, I saw you riding past my car <laughs> two hours ago. <laughs> It has taken me two hours since I saw you to get from my car to that parking lot onto the ship to tell you this. I yeah, I mean, I just... If you don't know Pete, Mr. Money Mustache, you, you must warm his heart with the bicycling, right? Well, I, I, I was able, same thing on Oahu. I was able during my working years to beat the traffic down to Pearl Harbor from here in central Oahu both ways, downhill and uphill, because the rush hours would be that bad. So uh, it, mm -hmm. uh, first, it seems like uh, a, a deprivation move. You're working hard and you're sweating like crazy. But after about a month of that, you realize there's a whole bunch of benefits and it's not just the physical benefits. Right, right. Yep. Sure. Awesome. Well, a little bit daughter like father with regards to military and with FI. It, 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 there's certainly a lot of influence here. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about the book you guys wrote together, The Savvy Family, how to raise the next generational personal finance group. And that's actually so important because as late starters, we didn't necessarily do a good job with that. We're mm -hmm. playing recovery of our kids from <laughs> poor financial habits, poor modeling. And the modeling that you exhibited, Doug, for Carol and Carol's ability to accept it and thrive with it just was it really, I made impressive. it my own. Well, at least in the book, it looks like you guys were on the same page, literally. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> Maybe not in reality. So I want to know why did you write this book? Oh, it, it all uh, starts with you. I had been talking at uh, various places like FinCon and uh, Camp FI and talking about reaching financial independence and high savings rate and a 4% safe withdrawal rate and all the numbers and all the mathematical calculations. And then at one of the Camp FIs, uh, one of the people in the audience after I was done with my beautifully crafted presentation that I'd given hundreds of times said, I understand all that. I just want to know how to raise my kids to have financial literacy. How do you do that? And I started babbling and it wasn't pretty. And it happened several times over the next few Camp FIs and meetups. And so we happened to be visiting Carol and KJ one day at their apartment. And we were all sitting around the dining room table uh, talking about the usual stuff, the uh, survival rate of the 4% uh, safe withdrawal rate, things like that. Casual dinner table conversation. <laughs> right. well, it, was all, it was all about sequence yes. of returns risk, as I recall. <laughs> yes. But uh, at some point, I said, I got that question of the Camp FI again. I got that question about teaching your kids. And, and Carol, did you have any memories of how we did? How, oh, how we yes, did? I did. I have and, a lot and, of memories. And, yes. And, and um, maybe it was therapy, but she did light up. She had a whole <laughs> bunch of things on her mind about how she finally uh, reached financial literacy and, and, and joined the financial independence movement. And she was talking and I was just staring at her and soaking it all up. And it was fat because I could immediately put that stuff to work, right? All I was going to do was plagiarize. I mean, 
repeat what she had told me and then go on to the next song. And about five minutes into that, I looked over at my spouse and she gave me that look, <laughs> yeah. which means you better be writing this down. And you were going to the transition seminar that week, right? You were getting right. out of the Navy. So and, when you are yeah. considering getting out of the military, even if you haven't actually made up your mind yet, about 12 months before you exit, you're required to go to what's called a transition class. It's a whole week long, and it's everything from how to operate with the Department of Veterans Affairs to Department of Labor workshop on how to find a job. They have a finance piece. They have all these different aspects of transitioning out of the military and into the civilian life. I was bored. I, <laughs> I knew most of this information because I had researched a lot of it before I had considered the possibility of maybe sort of leaving the military. And so I'm sitting there on my laptop writing an outline for what each chapter is going to discuss while the guy in the background is talking about how to kill off your debt. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I don't have debt. So I just had the, the book outline ready to go within the same week. And so all that was left to do was to write just fill it in. Yeah. Well, once again, I found myself scrambling to keep up with somebody who had far more initiative and creativity and things on her mind than her parents did. So and this we, Carol's book, and she just brought Nords along for the ride. Well, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> and it's, uh, it's different than the typical uh, personal finance book. There are many, many books out. We did the research. There are many, many books out there to talk about from a parental perspective, how to raise money smart kids or a money smart family, whatever the title is, but it's the parents and the ivory tower explaining how we did it and how it was such a raging success. Yeah. And as we did that, as we did that research, we found that there were very few of those books like zero that talked about the perspective from the child's point of view, mm -hmm. when the parents came up with that brilliant idea and then how the child either leaped in and cooperated with everything the parents thought of or initially resisted and eventually did it for their own version and mm -hmm. it continued on. And, and what was even better was that we now had a grown adult there to explain to us how she felt at the age when we unveiled this brilliant parenting tactic versus how she appreciates it now when she's the young adult raising her own daughter or raising her own money savvy family and beginning to realize karma has a wicked backlash mm -hmm. for starters, but also <laughs> beginning to appreciate that yeah, okay, if it worked with her, then it's going to work with the next generation. We sure hope so. And this time mm -hmm. she's going to get it right or she's going to try it a little differently. Mm -hmm. And so that book did not exist. And in fact, speaking as a guy who's written a couple of books, the editor, when we finally got past the developmental editing and got into the actual meat of the book, the editor said, you guys got to cut this, this out. You got you to write as one unified voice. You've got to talk to the reader in one voice because this back and forth stuff is just not going to work. You're diluting your financial literacy authority. You're confusing the reader. This no, can't do it. And we went out and took a poll of our Facebook audience. And, and most of it was on Camp FI, but also everyone else on Facebook. And we said, should we do this in alternating back and forth or should we do it in a, a one voice? And the overwhelming response was, please do it back and forth. And the editor did a lot of eye rolling, but she, she held us to it. You have to make sure that you only tell your side of the story and you can't put words in the other person's mouth. And you have to make a clear dividing line between what I said and what she now felt. I can say something. Yes, exactly. And so that, uh, that, mm -hmm. that process was painful, protracted. <laughs> It took a while to, to, so many things had gotten so intermingled that we had to be careful about the way that we weren't saying the exact same thing from different perspectives. The professional assessment of our version of the stories in chapter four from the developmental editor was, this chapter is a mess. <laughs> yeah. But she was right. And, yes. and we sorted it out. And so mm -hmm. the whole book is written like that. And that gives the, I think it gives the parent an appreciation for it's okay to make mistakes. Right. And it also gives you a feel for how your child is going to interpret your parental mandate, your parental initiative, and maybe they're not going to be on board. Yeah, dictatorship, authoritarian yeah. instead of authoritative, right? Yeah. right? It seemed collaborative. Yeah. I mean, Carol's upbringing seemed collaborative, unlike I was known as lecture daddy, and I was the dictator, <laughs> and I was telling my kids, this is how you do it. But that doesn't work. You modeled sure. these things. You engaged Carol in the process. And... I find when looking at Carol's timeline of her educational odyssey, it seemed pretty aggressive with big milestones at earlier ages than I would have ever imagined. I mean, but mm -hmm. it's also a great roadmap 
as you say, for next generation financial independence. I mean, Nords, you seem to get it right from the beginning. And uh, you know, I, I was stumbling as a parent. You know, one funny thing that uh, was in your book was there is normal and then there is Nordman. And that was, I that think, was... One, one, one of Carol's bosses that uh, came up with that one. And I'm kind of curious, where did all this financial act, was it all just stumbling forward and making mistakes? Because it doesn't seem like that. And where did you get all this knowledge as, as a parent? Did you get it from your parents? Did you just figure it out on your own? Uh, how did oh, that no. We, no, oh, no, 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 we had a blank slate in there. Uh, I did not get raised with financial literacy. I got raised by the random strikes of lightning method where you think you're doing a good job until suddenly there's this huge explosion and you regain consciousness and find out your parents actually objected to what you had just said or what you had just done. Financial literacy worked with my spouse and myself, right, in the 80s and 90s as we reached financial independence. And so part of it is if you're raising a money savvy family and it's clear that you have your own financial independence, your own retirement on track, then one day your child, right around the time they become a teenager, will look at that and say, well, if my lame parents are getting so close to financial independence with the techniques they're doing, how hard could it be? Maybe I should try some of this out. And so you don't necessarily have to be brilliant in your tactics, but we also had the benefit of a book by an author named David Owen. He wrote a book called The First National Bank of Dad. And it makes a great companion book to our book because in there he says that young kids and five, six, seven, eight years of age think that parents are crazy. And they know this because a parent will take a perfectly good piece of money and take it away from the kid and put it away for something called college. And, and when they learn more about this, it turns out that the parent wants them to go to school after they finish high school. And they want to have that money put away for like one or two lifetimes more than the kid's age before they can touch it again. So the only rational approach for a child at that age is to spend the money as fast as they can before it's confiscated by the fiscal authorities. And so you take that perspective from the child and David Owen says you have to you, the parent, have to get used to the thought of giving them a $20 bill and having them light it on fire and run around the yard like it's a 4th of July sparkler. Which, by the way, I've actually done before, not with a mm. literal $20 bill, but I did spend $20 <laughs> bills on cherry blossoms and sparklers fireworks. and other yeah. than legal New Year's Eve celebrational pyrotechnics mm -hmm. when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole idea is that the young kids, all they want to do is make choices with their money. They want to manage the money. They want to handle it. They want to dream and fantasize the possibilities. And they'll learn to manage their money at a very young age. The more opportunities they get, mostly by mismanaging it, making bad choices. But those are the teachable moments. When they bring a toy home and it doesn't work, or when all the other kids have something and they get it and it's just not the right thing for them. All these emotions and feelings around your decisions and your purchases and learning how to save and deferred gratification, all the feelings of that are ripe for discussions. How do you feel? What do you think you could do differently next time? Oh, remember when you tried that last month? How did you feel? There's no judging as much as there's a discussion about how they arrive at their decision and what their thought process is and what they would improve next time. And, and once they figured out how to manage the money, how they you literally handle it and order an ice cream cone at McDonald's as a, as a five-year-old, we learned that McDonald's actually trains their cashiers to take food orders from five and six-year-old kids to make it a good experience for future McDonald's purchases. But once they get that, that comfort feeling of managing the money, now you're ready to give them financial incentives. And I don't know about you guys in your working careers, but when I was in the Navy, I was all about the financial incentives and all about the bonuses and the rewards and whatever would get me to the next retention deadline incentive in the military. And it worked pretty much uh, like a charm with you too, right? You it did and it didn't. It reached the point where you have to wonder why they're giving you so much money. Um, oh, in the Navy. In the Navy. Yeah, yeah. Not your parents. Not my parents. Okay, okay, no. okay. <laughs> With my parents, the reason why they're giving me so much money is clearly I was failing the initial lesson, which was <laughs> what do you actually spend your money on that brings you joy? And it took a long time for me to do that. Um, I bought into Pokemon cards when they first became a thing, trying to figure out what was so cool about this. And right, I didn't learn my lesson until I did the same thing again with Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And it wasn't until Yu-Gi-Oh cards that I realized 
this doesn't work for me. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure it works for the other kids on the street that have the binders and the card games and the tournaments and everything else that they were doing, but that didn't work for me. But it took literally two iterations to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you talk about as the big picture is one of the chapters. Uh, you mentioned the cost of raising a child and the, we, we look at it as the opportunity cost of failing to raise a financially literate child. And the thing that I found fascinating and my wife did too when I talked to her about it was you don't teach your kids how to save first. You teach them how to spend first. And that's the way you start, which I thought was I'm a spendthrift and why shouldn't I learn to save first? But you have to learn to spend before you can learn to save. And that's part of the odyssey, right? Before you have to hit rock bottom, which is, I think, one of the themes of catching up to FI, right? Just about everybody that joins the Facebook group has gone through that part of their life where they feel like they bounced off the bottom and now they're ready to start upward progress again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that I noticed in your book was, I think a lot of parents feel like their child has to be a certain age before they can even start talking to them about money, before they can give them the opportunity to experience handling money. And that really doesn't have to be that way. I mean, you started fairly young. And, and I love that because, like you said, both of you, that you've got to, the way you learn is you're going to fail. You're going to fail multiple times over and over before you figure out what works for you and before you sort of build that muscle of the delayed gratification. I mean, no kid starts out thinking, oh, I'm going to wait six months and save up my money so I can buy this one thing. They've got to fail and feel the, the pain of that hurt. And so I love the fact that you started early with Carol and built some small wins and some small steps for right. to build right. on later. Well, you started with the physical money. I mean, I think Carol still has the bank for her spare change that you gave her to sort of count coins and stack coins because you say in your book, uh, you, you start teaching your kids about money when they stop eating it, right? You want to tell that story? <laughs> she, we, we were in the middle of a change of duty station and we were in a hotel room. And I left some spare change laying out in the hotel room and a 22 month old daughter wandered over and got a hold of a quarter and apparently they taste yummy. Uh, and then she uh, started to swallow it and got stuck in her throat. And you're a trained medical professional, Bill. You've seen those posters where you're supposed to gently pick the toddler up by their ankles and gently pat them on the back until they give up the money or whatever's blocking their airway. And of course, when you're supercharged with adrenaline and you're a rookie parent, you pretty much yank them up in the air and that little pat through that quarter all the way across the room by the time it stopped bouncing. But yeah, well, that was when we did that theme that we did so many times. I mean, it, you give us way more credit than is due when you tell us that we started so young, but the reality is we would start young and say, well, that didn't work. Let's wait six months and try again. <laughs> and so we could have wasted a whole chapter in the book on the theme of, well, that didn't work. Let's wait six months and try again. But that's again, what you'll do uh -huh. when you're raising uh -huh. them. If first you don't succeed. Yeah. Six months later, they've connected a couple more neurons and they're ready to understand what you're doing and why they right. would benefit from it. Right. And learning from your lesson, we did something a little bit different with my own daughter. She's yes. four years old at the time of this recording, but when she was about uh, two, two and a half years uh -huh. old, I, I took that coin holder and I dumped it out in front of her just to see what would happen. And she instantly picked it up and started going like, I said, no, don't do that. Slapped her hand out of the way, scooped it back up, ran away with it as fast as I could. Clear failure mm -hmm. the first time. Mm -hmm. But I waited yeah. another six months. And One out. of the things that y'all did that I love was the whole progress through the McDonald's story. Right. And, yes. and I mean, tell us a little bit about that because you, you started small, you grew as her maturity grew, but you kept using this one thing as a teachable moment. So McDonald's had a play place. That was the number one reason we went there. And I see it in my own daughter. I must have had an exorbitant amount of energy bouncing off the walls. You just need me to put me into a productive, safe means to actually expend said energy mm. that didn't involve pushing their buttons all the time. Mm -hmm. And so and they're done that. <laughs> well, you were known as Hurricane Carol, if I'm according exactly. to Exactly. <laughs> I would point out that's a famous, famous hurricane storm that destroyed most of the East Coast before it finally ran out of energy. <laughs> And so the McDonald's had a, pay, a play place, but at one point my parents said, hey, Carol, do you want some ice cream? I said, well, yeah, I mean, what kid doesn't <laughs> want ice cream? 
And so they would walk me over to the counter and they're like three feet from the counter and they would hand me the, the bills and they would coach me how to say it. And the first few times, of course, they didn't say it correctly, but I would look back at my parents and they would say, I think you mean you want an ice cream cone, please. And of course, the cashier hears that and they start tapping away as I'm me, 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 in, in my own voice. So just barely over the counter. And I would get my ice cream cone. It's like, this is awesome. I should do it again. So the next time and the next time and the next time I got better and better at saying the words and handing over the cash. And then eventually it was getting a bigger bill. Instead of getting the exact change, they gave me a $5 bill and I had to count the coins. This was... I want to say it was around elementary school, around the same time oh, that we yeah. started doing addition and subtraction. So we were you there was for... motivation to learn addition and subtraction because yeah. I wanted to make sure I got all my coins back. And we were getting her ready for a career as a McDonald's cashier, just in case. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> the change got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and at first it was just an ice cream cone, and then it was my meal, and then it was the whole family's meal. And it got to the point where my parents would walk into McDonald's and hand me a $20 bill. This is before inflation. And they would go find a table. <laughs> and send me to the front with the order, make the change, grab the tray, get everything scooped up together and go put it down at the table. And at that point, you're just like, okay, I'm ready to be an adult now. I got this. Just kick me out of here. And, and to <laughs> a, a young child, the power of being able to do that is incredible. And it just enables them and motivates them and keeps them going on that. Mm -hmm. And if they find a coupon for some McDonald's thing that they eat already, and you tell them that if they find the coupon, they get to keep half the savings, now you've got financial incentives. Yeah, I mean, what you did with profit sharing and a lot of things that we'll talk about was really progressive and was not in my vocabulary. And one of the things I think a lot of parents want to know about and un need to, and struggle with is allowances, chores, and jobs, and knowing the difference and how to approach those. Can you take us through your philosophy, which I think is a very healthy philosophy on allowances, chores, and jobs? We're, we're pretty much agnostic on that. We understand that some families, it's uh, controversial that you would give your kids an allowance and other kids, let them be kids. Don't make them work for money. <laughs> so we throw out those three ideas and parents can use whatever part of them works for their perspective and, and, and in their family. But the nice thing about an allowance is that they've got a constant stream of income, sort of like universal basic income, and <laughs> they can make decisions with that. And that way that they get the money, they really didn't have to do anything for it. Uh, we use the phrase, be a good member of the family. And we got away with that for years before she woke up one day and said, hey, what does that mean anyway? And because they're a good member of the family and they get that money, now they have a reason to make choices. They start finding out that they got five or six dollars of allowance saved up. And when you're five or six years old, that's financial independence. And now you got to make choices on spending that money. And, and your parents let you go and make any choices you want. The whole point is to look for those teachable moments and have those discussions in a judgment-free zone and figure out how their emotions control their decisions and what they would do differently in the future. Those are the teachable moments. Later on, you would introduce the concept of chores and jobs. Now chores, everybody's got to do some chores just to keep the house neat and clean and a nice place to live. And chores were something you did to hold up your part of the family having a nice place to live. Chores, you, you don't get paid for chores. But once you finish your chores and your homework, yeah. now you can have jobs. And jobs are things that we parents could do, but there were age appropriate tasks that we didn't mind at all farming out to her. And so as the child starts out young, you're going to give them a job that's going to be within their capabilities. I mean, when you're four or five years old, maybe washing the wheels in the car is about as much of a car wash as you're going to get. And it's going to involve a five gallon bucket and with swimsuits and hoses and a whole bunch of mess. But the whole point is that they learn how to do something for a sustained period of time, age appropriate task, and they get a couple of dollars. And we've been testing that out on neighborhood kids here in our neighborhood. And it's working like a charm and it worked great with her. So we feel this is sustainable. But the whole idea of jobs is that they learn to get more money. And again, it's a teachable moment. Hey, you just got five bucks for helping rake those leaves. What would you do with that money? Do you want to buy a bigger, better rake to rake more? Okay. Well, what about if you go to the store and get a good toy? Would you like to go get a good? Those are the things that you just coach them in and make sure they understand all the possibilities. And wow, if you made a million dollars, what would you do with a million dollars? Right? 
and there's a book for that too. There's literally mm-hmm. a book called yeah. If You Made a Million, and if that was million. one of my favorite picture uh, one of my favorite picture books growing up right. because that felt like a possibility. Five dollars to to someone who's five years old was a lot of money, and and a million didn't seem that so far off at the time, mm-hmm. mainly because the their zeros were right there, right? It really wasn't that hard to add more zeros. So and just a few decades later, yeah, it happened. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a question, Carol. I mean, part of this process, part of this learning and maturing process is that the kid has to understand the concept of money and get a perspective of $5 versus $500. So do you think that starting early to handle money, see how it works, see what it can do, do you think that helps a child just get a concept of how much is this particular denomination worth? Because to a kid, they're all pieces of paper with just different pictures on them. Or even worse, their debit card. Yes. Well, true. Yeah, yeah. Which, no, which the, is no is, perspective whatsoever. <laughs> right. And, and that's the big reason why handling cash at an age where I could count the cash was so important rather than using a credit card. Mm-hmm. And it depends on how perceptive the kid is, is that balance on a cash register is, are they paying attention to those numbers? Is that 50 or 500 or like you mentioned? The, the big thing was converting that from a number on a paper to something physical that I could understand. And so for me, growing up as a millennial, it was all about pe- Pokemon, <laughs> right? You could get a pack of Pokemon cards for five bucks, and then you could get a Pokemon Game Boy game for 20 bucks, red, yellow, blue. But the actual Game Boy that you needed to play the game on that cost 100 bucks. And so you're starting to add up everything, right? You can buy a bunch of packs of Pokemon cards, but then you can't afford the game or the Game Boy that you need to play. And so suddenly you're sitting there holding a bunch of cards, but you're not able to join your friends that are all tapping away at their Game Boys. And and that builds the emotional backing to understanding those different values. Would I rather have $5 cards or would I rather wait just a little bit longer, hold off when I'm buying more cards, enjoy what I have in the meantime, and get the darn Game Boy so I can actually enjoy that. And, and maybe there's an opportunity to wash a car or rake some leaves or paint something and even earn even more money for that. And Accelerate so, it, yeah. Now you have an incentive. And I would rather watch her make a mistake with a $5 bill when she's five years old than I'd rather watch her make a mistake with a $50 bill when she's a teenager than to watch her make a $5,000 mistake in college or a $50,000 mistake with their 401k. And so you're going to burn a lot of money on a five, six, seven year old to get them to learn how to manage money. And when I say a lot of money, I mean, maybe it's a, a week's wages uh, for a parent over several years. Mm-hmm. That money, as wasted as it is at the time, is not wasted in the long term because they do learn that financial literacy, their responsibility, and in the very, very long run, they're going to be making financial decisions for us as well one day. Mm-hmm. And at that point, they're going to be managing a lot more than $50,000. And it's got to last for a long enough time to last me the rest of my life. Right, right. I think that all the parents need to understand they've got to to deal with what's in front of them, the maturity level of their child. And if you've got <laughs> multiple children, it won't even happen the same for each one. I have kids Not that handle all. money completely differently. So that's just part of their personality, not necessarily what we taught them. So you, you've got to gauge. You can't you can't start too young and expect too much, but that I don't think you should wait too late either. So my question right now is you mentioned debit cards. At what point did you switch from cash to a debit card? In my time, there's a lot of physical legal limitations to having a debit card. And so I never actually owned a debit card, except for what you would use to slot into the ATM to pull out money. But that was just a ATM card. It didn't actually. But at the time, when I was growing up in the early 2000s, checkbook was the next big step. And so when I was used to handling cash, it reached the point where do I feel like I can handle blank checks? And just like with cash, it was all about giving me a checkbook and teaching me how to write the checks and learning how to manage the checkbook. And Keeping track of the actual physical checkbook was way easier than balancing a checkbook. I mean, <laughs> talk about math skills there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and writing skills. You got to write the numbers neat enough to understand how you're going to balance your checkbook. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but while I'm struggling internally with making sure I have the checks written out properly, keeping track of how much I've written on checks, it's the same thing that you do nowadays with a credit card swipe. You're trying to yep. make sure that you keep track of the swipes, whether it's 
on a phone or in your head or, or however else to make sure that you're not um, over uh, reducing whatever money you have available. Spending so, too much. Spending yeah. too much. Yeah. Easily progressed depending on the technology of your generation from cash that you physically hold that you can physically count to some kind of intermediary, whether that's a checkbook or a credit card or a debit card or Venmo or some kind of intermediary like that to mm -hmm. the bigger concept of your portfolio and your financial wealth, which is broken down into all these different accounts and pots and, and goals and siphons and so forth. I'll, I'll point out too that it comes full circle now because I finally have somebody to help me set up Apple Pay and Apple Wallet. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it, it's a two-way street in learning, right? Uh, one of the things, one of the things you did that I think was unique, and I haven't heard that other parents have done it, is the Bank of Carol, and using CDs as a method of teaching compound interest. Can you take us through that hack? I, I've I've got to give credit to David Owen again for coming up with that. And it was his method of shamelessly bribing his kids. Uh, I felt like it was pretty reasonable to do one penny per dollar per month. Uh, you do the I've never seen that. that rate since. Oh my goodness. Right. You, yeah. never want to, you never want to live in a world that has 12% interest for your CDs. Yeah. But, but when you're a kid, you can do one penny per dollar per month. Those are all quantities that a kid can understand and can probably do deferred gratification to last the whole month. David Owen used to use uh, much higher numbers with his kids, and he found out he made them rich before they uh, actually figured out those concepts. <laughs> and the whole idea behind that CD is, again, it's a teachable moment for discussing the possibilities. You could buy that Pokemon card deck right now, but if you put your money in a Bank of Carol CD and waited a while, and, and every week you'd get a glowing report from Quicken, you'd have uh, progress charts, you'd have graphs, you'd have all the information, all the marketing you needed to understand that if you waited just a little bit longer, you could buy that next step. And did I mention there was a job we needed done for $5 if you wanted to earn extra money and get to your goal faster? So we made it all about the thrill awaiting at the end of the deferred gratification. We made it all about motivating somebody along the way, getting all the feedback and all the incentives and all. I mean, we do it on Choose FI. We do it on Catching Up to FI. We do it on all the Facebook social media, getting better and better tools to help you visualize where you're heading for your financial security. And so it works. It worked very well. And, and it's continuing to work very well, not just for right, me, but right. that's a new revolution in banking structure right. is you have high yield savings accounts. Now you have places like SoFi and Ally, for example, where they not only have a, a visual online number of how much you've had in that account, but they have this bucket system where you can right. um, make certain goals and put money in those different buckets, even though it's just one account. They have these little incentives where you reach your goal, you get the confetti paper and you get all the, the, the good <laughs> stuff, all the congrats and you've, you've met your goal and let's save some more. And so what you developed in the 90s and the 2000s before Facebook and all the other 1990s, tech launched. Yes, I'm yes, sorry. Yes, 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 you're right. In the 19th century. Yes. Yeah. Now it's, I'm sorry. No, that's 1900s. That's the 20th century. The 1900s, yeah. not yeah. the 20th century. Yeah. Sorry, kids these days got to learn. But that's the sort of incentive where it's in one format then, but you're still going to find a similar format nowadays. Mm -hmm. That's a theme is reaching uh, financial independence. Back in the day, we used uh, clay tablets and wooden styluses, and we were using an abacus to keep track of the numbers. <laughs> and the tools today, on one hand, there's so many more tools, and they're much more confusing. But having all those choices gives you mm -hmm. many more ways to visualize and many more ways to find something that works for you. And so when people read the book and say, yeah, okay, Bank of Carol CD, but how am I going to implement today? Well, today you've got more choices and you just have to find the one that really, really motivates your adolescent or your mm -hmm. tween or your teenager mm -hmm. and, and go with that. One of the things that I think this did that I really love is it developed not only money personality, but money trust because she's right. giving her money to you and having to trust the institution, the bank of dad, that it will give her money back with that interest. And then it also taught, I think, Carol, yeah. to learn the difference between we can't afford that, which a lot of parents say, to how can we afford that? Okay, it's the old Paula Pant, you can have anything but not everything. And you did that with a young child. How old was Carol when you started the Bank of Carol and the CDs? Because that's one of the things I find fascinating was you were much younger than I would have possibly imagined you could do it with a child. Six, seven? 
Do you remember? I don't remember. And the reason why I don't remember is because it happened for that long. And so, I felt like it's always, I, I remember <clears throat> something between getting my first allowance and sometime before the kid 401k, there's a bank of kid in between. And, and it feels as though the bank of kid had, had existed as soon as money started flowing into my hands. So, I would, I would say six, maybe even age five, but somewhere in there. Uh, again, I'm not saying it's a, ne a necessary condition or a milestone or something parents should look forward to or worry about. It's something that you talk about, and one day when they show interest, you set one up and see if they like it. And if they do, great. If they don't care, if it doesn't seem to really gel, then just wait six months and try again. And so, you know, imagine this. The child, the child of scientists and nuclear engineers has a, a, a grasp of numbers, but uh, maybe it's just the coincidence that she was writing. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding this right. So the Bank of Carroll basically was – Doug, she would give you money as, quote, savings, and you paid her some interest. And we okay. would track this on Quicken. So she would have her allowance. She would see her allowance, and we would give her dollars for the allowance, physical dollars. And then if she gave that back to us and she had to have faith in the banking institution, which is a big step even for grownups, if she gave that back to us, then we would give it interest and we would show her in a Quicken chart and we would do printouts and we would I, – I, I would – market the heck out of this. And that whole system was designed to say, well, sure, if you uh, take your money and, and run away right now, you can go get a pack of cards. But if you wait another month and mm -hmm. you do some jobs, mm -hmm. what's your plan? What's your goal? What would you mm -hmm. like? What would you like to do? We can imagine the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And and that seemed to work really well. Especially yeah. the days where you said things like you would actually have your wallet in your hand, reaching for the bills. <laughs> and you knew you could trust it because you physically saw it happening. And what I also appreciated was that you had the in-house bank of kid first before you yep. introduced yep. a real bank. Yep. And I didn't have my first checking account until I was eight, almost nine years old, I believe. It was a nine, you were nine years old. Yeah. That was the minimum age at the time. That sounds late. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> eight, eight, no, I'm just, I'm teasing. It's unbelievable. When your elementary school has the scholastic book fair and oh, all yeah. the kids are running around trying to figure out how to buy these books and your fourth grader whips out her checkbook and starts writing a check to the teacher for the pile of books she has in front of her, it gets back to you parents. <laughs> and when you go to the open house, they go, oh, you. Yeah, we know you. So you're it, that it one. Is, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you're, you're raising that one. Now it makes sense. But that does bring them to the attention. And nine years old, the credit union had that limit. That was the checking account. And when the credit union also did that, uh, shocked me a little, they gave her an ATM card when she opened the checking account. Wow. So the first thing we parents had to do was show her how to use an ATM card. Uh -huh. And fortunately, we didn't have to take much time on that because I think it was, what, two weeks later, you lost the ATM card? Yeah. And you see that face? It's been, it's been several decades. It's been multiple but, decades, and I still remember losing that darn card. Because, because ATM cards back then cost a lot of money. And if you wanted another ATM card from the credit union, it cost $25. So, and that was like uh, two months worth of allowance at that well, time or something gotcha. ridiculous like who, that. Who lost the ATM card? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we never yeah. found it. I mean, I, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't a parental trick or anything. She <laughs> lost it on her own and we never found it. No, nobody wow. ever did anything with it. But it, wow. it was a more powerful lesson than I could ever teach. It was a $25 mistake as a nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. Apparently it has scarred mm -hmm. you for life. I and, know, right? <laughs> and so now you have internalized the lesson that we've been trying to teach. So I see that you're you're handling money and you're giving them practice in real world scenarios like you're teaching compound interest with and and the fact that a bank is an institution a bank is a thing that is going to handle your money. So I love this because it builds and builds and builds until you reach the real world as a somewhat adult so I, I've got another question. In today's world of everything being electronic, would you suggest that you still go through the paper dollars, a checkbook, that you go through some process to work up to the fact that they're going to have a debit card or a credit card? Or Because, I mean, my, my kids, I still have a checkbook register. My kids don't. And I honestly don't understand how they keep track of it <laughs> because I'm so and, used to the checkbook register. And, and to your point, who not many people hand over checks anymore. You might see that one person in the grocery store that's actually handing a paper check, but that doesn't really have relevance to, especially, I can't believe they're called this, that my daughter is part of Gen Alpha. And so 
But Gen Z, Gen Alpha, what's uh -huh. a checkbook? Why do I care? Right. I, what kids see is they see the exchange of cash. What kids see is they see the credit card swipe. What they see is the Apple Pay or the Google Pay or whatever it is. They see the phone tap. Mm -hmm. And that's what they want. They want the power that their parents have and are somehow withholding from the child. Mm -hmm. And so you want to introduce that power in a way that the kid can visualize and measure. And so that's why cash was so brilliant. You can see the $5 bill and the 50 cents and you can see those numbers. But there's always a point where the kid is going to lose the cash. Okay, well, if losing cash is an issue, let's look at getting a debit card. That way it's just one card you have to keep track of and, until you lose it. And then deal with the consequences <laughs> of losing it in the same way that you've dealt with the consequences of losing cash. Mm -hmm. And then when they gain proficiency, when month after month there's nothing going on because it's routine at that point, then you're ready to continuously step up and step up and step up. And part of the, the challenge for parents today, it's a challenge I haven't crossed yet, is when to introduce electronic devices such as cell phones with Apple Pay. When do you introduce a watch that has Apple Pay? When do you start adding in those? Here's, here's your checkbook register. Right. Yeah. Right, right. And, and see, I, for me, it's not as tactical as what we used to be, or used to have, rather. But but it's just, I mean, you're right. They This is what they see. This is what they're going to want to do. And what's interesting and to your is point, in, in my generation, we did a lot of things on notebooks and textbooks, and I'm watching younger cousins, I'm watching kids, older kids of other families, where a lot of times they don't even have textbooks. They're opening up their iPads, they're opening up their mm -hmm. Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little more difficult to me to imagine what it would be like to have that digital world from the get-go, because I didn't. I was, I'm that millennial generation that had one foot in the pre-internet age and one foot in the post-internet age. But the new generations that are coming up, all they know is not physical. They know digital. And so mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. seems more foreign to us is actually more comfort for them. And there's right. actually a service that I would like to highlight. And I think Doug is a fan of FAMZOO, right? Can you tell us about that? Oh, yes. And maybe that, how that yeah. plays a role in bridging the digital gap? We, we all know the founder through FinCon, and Bill has a fam I think he's got five kids in his family, so Allowance Day was a logistics exercise and having enough cash to hand out to everyone. And so early on, he introduced the family debit card, and so he figured out from his technical background how to set up the account for the kids with the debit card and all the online tools they needed to track everything they did, either back then it was on laptops and tablets and eventually on phones. And so he could monitor their spending as a parent. They could monitor their own spending. It was their own problem as the person with the account. But he could also set limits and goals and guardrails and, and even barriers if necessary to help them use their financial literacy in an age appropriate manner or they all had different temperaments. And so he would work with their strengths and their weaknesses on that. And he's been doing that business model for what, easily 15, 20 years now, right? It has has to be, it been yeah. that long? Yeah, I think, yeah, we wrote about it in 2018, but yeah. I knew about it in FinCon 12 or FinCon 13. So he's been doing it for at least a decade. Mm -hmm. and, and there are many services like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Bill positions himself as the family-friendly uh, service that really understands from making it work in his family, how it will work in your family. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate, I really enjoy watching the business model as he rolls out the marketing. I think Arya is going to do it in a completely different way that absolutely would, as to her, the way I learned would make absolutely no sense. And right. even the way you learn doesn't make much, that's the way my grandmother did that. Uh, no, that doesn't make any sense to me. Right. And and we joke about that all the time. Grandpa, what does it mean to dial a phone? Grandpa, what does it mean to put a key in a door? Why do we have to do these things when I can just do it with my finger? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more tools out there. I'm really excited to get chance to practice this on the next generation because we're very good at having conversations. I just want to see where the technology goes. Mm -hmm. You should mm -hmm. have seen my daughter's face the first time she tapped the TV and nothing happened. And she, wait, this is not a tablet. I can't just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How funny. So we've got a, a savings account that's earning interest as a, a tool. So did you move on at some point to 401k with a match type of thing? I think we're being fed the questions here. Yes, yes. <laughs> when, when she was eight years old, the big news in the military, the U.S. military, was that we were starting a 401k. Up until that point, the U.S. military did not have a retirement program like a 401k. All we had was serving until 20 years and getting a pension, 
or getting out and getting our own money somewhere else and mm-hmm. figuring out our finances as veterans instead of as retirees. When the thrift savings plan was getting started for the military, it had been already out there for the federal civil service for about 10, 15 years. So the massive marketing campaign was all over and running around and everybody knew about the thrift savings plan coming. And it was almost her eighth birthday. And so we thought, wow, we're being marketed at to save for retirement, to use a 401k. And everybody's telling us about 401ks and we can't get away from it. So why don't we try doing something like that with Carol? And so for her eighth birthday, we sat her down and at the time she was getting an allowance, I believe it was like five or six dollars yeah. a week. We were doing the allowance that you were five years old, so you got five dollars a week. And we told her we were gonna raise her allowance to twelve dollars a week, some outrageous double yeah. digit number. I mean, it was like she was hired in a new family or given a big raise. But it turned out that she had to make mandatory contributions to her kid 401k. And so we introduced all those concepts on her eighth birthday. And as soon as the sugar from the birthday cake was filtering out of her system, she began to understand that she was given more money and she got to keep a little bit of it, but most Mm -hmm. of it had to go to this mandatory retirement savings. And uh, it was gonna be invested by the uh, authoritative uh, parents who knew how to invest this money. And the, the big goal, now, again, when you're eight years old, this goal at age 16 is an entire lifetime away. Mm -hmm. The big goal was at, age 16, she'd have $5,000 to buy a car. And that was why we were starting this at eight years old. Now, behind the scenes, we had figured out how much money she needed to put in every week, how much the matching was going to be from the parents. The stock market performance was awesome. I it think was it was miraculous. like 18, 20% yes. every year. There's like this golden For period between like 2000 years. and you know, 2006. Yeah. 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 It matured, ironically, it matured right in, in 2008. Yeah. But... We made everything work behind the scenes and we actually went on Choose FI and did a video explaining to other parents how to put together the kid 401k and it's in the appendix of the book. And so you learn how to set this long-term gratification up. Now it's not voluntary, it's happening behind the scenes. She really can't do anything with it. She could have made additional contributions, right? She could have gone from the elective deferral limit to the annual additions limit and had maybe a mega backdoor Roth 401k if that (laughs) vocabulary had existed back then, but she was perfectly happy knowing that at age 16, she'd have enough money, $5,000 oh, man. to buy any car she wanted. Now, every parental initiative comes with unintended consequences. And if I could see what those consequences were, I would maybe have made different decisions. But one of the things that happened was that we instantly started evaluating the value of every car in the road. And, and we would look at, as anywhere, anytime we were driving anywhere, she would look at the other cars and she'd say, well, I don't like that one, but I like that one. That one seems okay. I think I want this one. At one point, she was going to buy a, a hot Mustang and rip out <laughs> the engine and transmission and put in an electric motor. Uh, we do now own a Mustang Mach-E, so mission accomplished. Yeah, well, she had to wait a while, but she finally got her, her goal. And, and it, it was interesting because it wasn't that she had the gimmies like a kid does the week before Christmas when they're bribing Santa Claus. It was more that she could see that there was this long-term plan and she'd better be ready. If there was going to be a 16th birthday, that is not the time to start thinking about what car you want to own. you got to give this seven or eight years of deep thought to make sure you're ready to seize that moment when you turn 16. <laughs> And then I, I don't know if you've read the story about the uh, tweens talking trash one day at sports, but they were like 11, 12 years old. Mm-hmm. I'm the parent sitting on the sideline pretending to read my book and hoping nobody busts me overhearing this conversation. <laughs> but the first the first 12 year old said, when I'm 16 years old, my parents are going to buy me uh, a Cadillac Escalade. I don't know what it was at the time. That was a hot car. These guys had been watching uh, the TV shows in Cribs and mm-hmm. Pimp My Ride, so they knew all the vocabulary. And the next kid said, well, yeah, well, my parents, when I'm 16 years old, they're going to buy me a Hummer. And I, there's only one kid left who hasn't made her, her feedback yet, and I couldn't see how you are going to top that. And she said, I'm going to buy any car I want because I'm going to be 16 years old and have my own money, $5,000. I'm going to go out and buy whatever car I want. And the other kids said, oh, you're going to do what? And there's a whole conversation, but it took all the gimmies, all the competition out of the discussion. And the unintended side effect was that all these kids went home and said, mom, dad, where's my kid 401k? I, I need a kid 401k for once. 
<laughs> so a couple of weeks later at the sporting fair, right? You know, the other parents are coming up saying, hey, hey, Norts, tell us about this kid 401k, will you? We've got a demand for that in our family. And yeah, yeah. It, it did work. And when mm-hmm. she got to that 16 year old age, she actually uh, came well, up with a, well, that's your story. Well, yeah. but, but, yeah. but she leveraged that money. She, mm-hmm. she surprised you. And I, mm-hmm. Carol, I want to hear this part of the story. Uh, around the time that I was 14 years old, so I still have two more years before I'm allowed to drive, the family Taurus was falling apart, to put it nicely. Uh, I remember a couple of times it stopped on the side of the road and a couple of battery jumps, and it was definitely time for that car to go. And so my parents were looking at buying this new thing called a hybrid, and there is this especially new hybrid out called the Toyota Prius, and it was cool. But it was also, I believe, $22,000. I couldn't, I couldn't give myself permission to buy it. It was just an obscenely high amount of money in 2008. And it was just, I really wanted one, but I couldn't just, it just didn't, I didn't see the value. And I really saw the tech. Anyway. Anyway, my birthday is late in the year. And I had already figured out the math that by the time I had my driver's license at 16, I'm actually going to be leaving for college at 17 and a half. So why was I going to spend $5,000 for a car for only a year and a half? There's there's probably a better way to do this than to buy a car and then 18 months later have to do something about it. And so I'm hearing my parents in the front seat while we're driving somewhere talking about getting a new car, but it costs $22,000, but but we could we have that money, we could spend that money, but yeah, it's the principal and <laughs> and then at some point I said, well, what if I put in my $5,000 and just drove the car for the year and a half that I'm home and then it's yours after that and I take my $5,000 back? And I can't remember the last time there were crickets in the front seat. Yeah, she, she, she stopped us. Whoa. <laughs> well, the bank of Carol became, that's leverage, baby. Did, did you have to pay interest on the loan that she gave you to buy your new car? First off, this is that legendary teachable moment. So you have to do this. You can't say, oh, I, I don't want to do that. I want to stick to the original plan. And yet what we looked around for a model. How can we make this work? And what we came up with was the idea of the car lease. And so you lease the car and you drive the car and you do whatever. But at the end of the terms of lease, when you return the car, you have to comply with all the conditions of the lease. And if there's excess wear and tear, you have to pay a little money to come up with penalty money that you owe for abusing the car during the lease. There was a uh, one minor fender bender in a parking lot in Walmart. It was not your fault. And in my defense, we both looked at each other's bumpers and said, you know what? Have a good Christmas and, and moved on with That's our lives right. when it happened. But there was a small golf ball sized dent in the fender. And if you knew that you were looking for it, then you would find it. But if you didn't know you were looking for it, you would not find it. So I believe that was a $200 deducted off oh, yeah. $5,000. But total. you saw that dent every day. Yeah, it was yeah. a reminder of what I just did. <laughs> And so I go to college with $4,800 in my kid 401k, which has now been, what's the phrase, distributed? It's been distributed at this oh, yeah. point. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's mine. It's no longer in mom and dad's bank account. It's in my bank account. And more specifically, I had it in a series of CDs with our bank. And so I had- at, at far less than 12%. Oh, it was only like 2% <laughs> at the time. Oh man, pre-pandemic, 2% was a lot. Yeah. But I had these CDs and I reached a point in college where at the time my campus didn't have enough housing for the undergrads. There was a good chance that you're going to be kicked off campus, as they called it, for at least a year. And so I voluntarily went off campus. I was in Navy ROTC waking up at five in the morning, so I could not handle the campus raves at 10 p.m. at night. Maybe I should go into the quieter apartment blocks of a few blocks down the street. And so I was going to need a car. And I did everything that you were supposed to do in that era. I got on Craigslist because this was before Facebook Marketplace. I, I got on Craigslist and I started looking at cars. And I realized that with $4,800, I could actually afford a Honda CRV, an older model of a Honda CRV. But oh man, I can afford a Honda CRV. And I started looking at everybody that was selling, I kid you not, in 2012, I was looking at 1999 Honda CRVs, but it was a CRV. And so we finally found a, a seller. The town I was living in at the time was a big medical school. So he had finished medical school and was selling his car before he returned back to his home country. And so I had $4,800 in my hand, but I bought the car for $4,200. So I still had that $600 left over to accessorize and to, <laughs> and to make the car mine. Did, did you get some hot rims or something? <laughs> no, I got seat covers. Uh, I, I had seen what happens to hot rims. And I still occasionally 
hit the curb. So I had learned that lesson. In, in Hawaii, the, the essential auto accessory is having uh, neoprene seat covers with uh, a, a floral or a turtle design on them. Uh-huh. And, uh-huh. and it gives the aloha. So every time you put your butt in your car seat, you feel like you're back in Hawaii. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So I, I have a question here and either one of you can answer this question. Not everything is going to go according to plan. There are going to be (laughs) snafus. So share with us one of the things that y'all tried to do that was not quite successful. Hmm. I I have a a picture in my brain, but I'll let you go first. Things that did not go right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The big bailout of 2009. Oh, okay. Well, you can go with that one. You would think. I just I just gave you this entire monologue about being able to keep track of your checkbook and being able to keep track of your account balance and taking something that was physical and just keeping it in memory, right? Uh-huh. Until the day I completely and utterly failed at that and had overcharged my credit card by $250 more than I physically had in my wallet, in my bank account, hidden in the seat cushions, the whole nine yards. And I figured this out the day before the credit card bill was due. Classic teenager, right? And I swallowed my pride and <laughs> called a family discussion. This never gets old. Yeah, and, <laughs> and explained that I had, I had overcharged my credit card by 250 bucks and I could not return the earbuds or any of the other things I had charged on my credit card. It was, <laughs> this, this was, this was my fault and I needed to dig myself back out of a $250 hole. Then I was smart enough to recognize that if I missed that credit card payment, that was going to be a bigger consequence than swallowing my pride and asking my parents for a temporary loan. Yeah, a little bigger, yeah. And, and <laughs> you all did what you usually do, which was you had a discussion and then you came back with the verdict. And the verdict was I was going to be given the $250 up front. I think I was given two weeks, a week or so to work. Oh, it was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I had to work it all back within those two weeks. Uh-huh. And if uh-huh. I didn't work it th- within those two weeks, then I was paying your interest rate. Yes. And I don't, I don't think I actually asked what that interest rate was. I didn't even want to know at that point. At this point, she would rather have been paying interest to city than to be paying interest to her parents. Yeah. So Carol, at some point you need to go back in our library and listen to my son's story. Ooh. He was in episode Top Gun Finance. And yes, very similar circumstances. <laughs> he had calculated exactly when his paycheck from the Air Force was going to hit and he was wrong. <laughs> oh. And he had to drive across the country to go to training and he had no gas. <laughs> oh, ouch. Yep. And they yep. did not have government travel cards back then. So, double ouch. <laughs> no, no. I'm sure glad I was never like that when I was that age. <laughs> mm, yeah. Mm. <laughs> right. I know. That's true. We were all stupid. <laughs> we were all young and stupid. Okay. All right. So, Doug, what's your story? Well, this is a story where she actually was smarter than her parents and where we parents made the mistake, and that was the cell phone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That was, oh, yeah. That was a good one. Okay, just lean back good. and bask in the reflective <laughs> glory there. Sure <laughs> we had a competition going on in our neighborhood with everybody, the adults, buying cell phones. Now, this was in 2005, 2004, long before the iPhone even came out, but you still had candy bar phones and flip phones and people were displaying them. And, and my spouse and I, when you actually had the duty at your command, you would be issued a radio, a brick, a big radio that you could talk to the command on channel 21 or whatever. And they could call you anytime, day or night and ruin your life. And, and later on, we moved up for the duty section. We moved up from the walkie talkies to pagers. And again, that pager would go off in your nightstand and hop all over and make noise. And Bill, you're familiar with this from the medical side. Pagers still exist in hospitals because they haven't found a better way. to, right? And all that metal and concrete, you got to have a pager. And and then later on, my spouse had a job where she actually had a government-issued cell phone. And, well, we were miserable because any one of her watch officers could reach out and touch her 24-7 and did. And then she had to make decisions. But we felt like we were being punished by our electronics because we were so reachable. And in the middle of this, Carol comes home and says, hey, I'd like to get a cell phone. I think I should have a cell phone. And we were like, oh, that's nice. And well, imagine the possibilities. How much money would you need? What would you do? And how would you make it work? And it became clear in the ensuing discussions that we parents thought a cell phone was a wonderful idea for somebody else, but not for us. And we left her to figure it out on her own. Now, at the same time, we had a landline and answering machine, and she was about 12, 13 years old. 
and again, I'm sure glad I wasn't doing this at that age when I was that age, <clears throat> but our, our phone would ring and, and ring and ring and ring and they would hang up without leaving a message. And then the phone would ring again and hang up without leaving a message. And finally, some teenager's voice would say, come on, Carol, pick up, pick up. Are you there, Carol? And this would happen all hours of the day and night. And it got to the point where we actually shut off the ringers on our landline and just left the answering machine to record. And we'd, they would have 20 calls in the answering machine and it would be none of the other adults. It would all be the kids uh, trying to get a hold of Carol. And we hadn't figured out how to solve that problem, and we really didn't know what to do about it. Uh, but when she turned 14 and got her state work permit to work part-time, she went out and got her own part-time job. And I think Miss Amy had been hinting broadly for For quite a very a long time. I was not picking up the hints at first, yep. Carol was guaranteed employment at the age of 14 from a, a local uh, franchise owner. And so for her first paycheck, she went out and bought herself a Walmart cell phone. And what we didn't appreciate was that phone calls stopped like that. Instantly, the, our landline stopped ringing. Our lives got a tremendous amount better because she had the phone and they could call her or text her anytime they wanted. And later on, as Carol pointed out to us, and you were pretty professional about it, I don't think there was any gloating involved. Uh, she was finally being told about the uh, study groups. She was being told about the school projects. She was being, I mean, there was plenty of gossip going on. But it turned out that phone was an essential tool for networking at school and for being part of the group and knowing what was going on and getting your work done and getting good grades. And as parents, we had no clue about that. Today, it's fairly straightforward. And today, I'm pretty sure parents are debating what to do when that uh, child shows up for kindergarten with an Apple Watch on their wrist and uh, wants to call mom because they don't like how they're being treated by the kindergarten teacher. So it's always been a race with technology in our generation and this generation. It's going to continue in the next generation. Mm -hmm. And again, us parents, we really didn't appreciate the cell phone aspect of it. And if we'd taken the time to think more about the conversation from her perspective instead of from our perspective and ask more thoughtful questions about why it was impacting her life, maybe we could have turned that around. We'll, we'll never know, but we're going to try again for the next generation here and see if we can get it right with uh, her daughter. Mm -hmm. Those don't sound like the kind of mistakes I made. <laughs> much, much bigger. <laughs> and that's the joy of reading your book, or it's the joy of getting it right. And we had the joy of getting it wrong serially. And we're in recovery right. mode, like a lot of late starters <clears throat> are. And recovering a child from the unintentional consequences of parental behavior is so much harder than getting it right prospectively, which is one of the reasons I really encourage our late starter audience to read this book because even their adult kids are gonna need these helps and then their grandkids. You guys are gonna to have to write the next book where it's three generations or <laughs> you write it with your daughter about what it was like. Mm -hmm. This will, you can pay it forward with these things. Mm -hmm. The one thing I really wanna know though is because Carol is financially independent essentially. Going and, on five years, six years now, financially independent? Yes. Yeah, that's incredible. The, the lesson I want to know about is how did you teach or learn that a high savings rate got you there? And then you talk about from living like a monk to living like an ensign and not allowing lifestyle inflation to progress. And then you use the gaps to increase your savings rate. How do you teach that to a kid so that in their 20s, they take advantage of that profound power of compounding to reach independence like you did in your late 20s, early 30s? In my time, I can't believe I just said that. In my time, 2008 was in the middle of high school for me. And so I saw the before and after of what the recession did. The first two years, 2006, 2007, everybody is going to school five days a week. I know that sounds so weird. Hang on with me. We're going to school five days a week. Teachers are talking about their upcoming retirement. Students are talking about the colleges they're going to go to. Then the parents are talking about the home renovations they're about to do. Everybody's got a plan for their money coming up. And then seemingly overnight when the recession happened, 
the, the home state I was in actually could not afford to have the public schools open for five days a week. They physically could not afford the utilities because of the recession. And so we had what were called furlough Fridays. We were not allowed on school campus on Friday. We said, what do you mean? And they said, we will arrest you if you come to school on Friday. And so I come home with a big grin on my face saying to my dad, they're going to arrest me if I go to school on Friday. I'm not going to school anymore. <laughs> but, but at the same time, you start seeing those teachers who suddenly stop talking about their retirement yep. because they just lost whatever money they had invested, if they had any money invested to the recession, or they had family members that they suddenly had to take care of because they ran out of money. I remember one of my friends, she was the youngest of three, and she's the one that's always wearing Stanford, Harvard, and University of Hawaii, all kinds of different sweatshirts to school because she was thinking about all her different options for school. And there was one day where she just came in angry, and I'd never seen her so angry. And she said, my parents started a renovation on the house last year, and between that and the recession, they can no longer afford to send me to college. So I can't go to any of the dream schools I want to go to. I'm going to have to go to the state school here. And that was an overnight change in her circumstances, completely out of her control. Yep. Yep. And I came to understand, especially from the recession, that money was choices. And money was the ability to choose from a wider and wider palette of options what you actually wanted to do. And so in the times when I had very little choice, when you're a brand new ensign and you're being told exactly where to go and what to do and how to do it because <laughs> you are physically not allowed to make decisions for yourself in some cases, it was very easy for me to take that money and just save it. It wasn't like I was going to spend it. I, I didn't have the time. That 1999 Honda CRV spent more time in my driveway because the ship was out so often and you weren't allowed to leave your car in the parking lot on the pier. You had to leave it at your house. So it was easier to... Uh, to, to bicycle into the ship or to take a cab into the ship and be gone for six months. And then when you're gone for six months, there's this wonderful scene in the movie Moana where Hey Hey the Chicken has this coconut cover taken off his head and he looks around and he realizes that there's nothing but water. And that is every ensign in the Navy the first time they get really underway <laughs> where you are so far away from land that you can't even get cell signal. And you realize I have no means right now, not even quality bandwidth for amazon.com to spend money right now, nor to enjoy my money. Everything I have to rely on is on the ship. And until that ship gets back to port, I have nothing. Are you qualified yet? No. <laughs> and so I didn't have time to go drinking on the weekends because there was no bar in the middle of the ocean. I didn't have time to go driving my car and go on different joy rides because I was in the middle of the ocean. Are you qualified yet? No. <laughs> and then when we pulled in the port, because I was not qualified yet, ah, yeah, okay. I had to stand the watches at the ship to get qualified. So even when you are in Istanbul, Turkey for four days, I only actually got to go walk around for a day instead of all four. And so every opportunity that I missed because I didn't have the choice, I was saving money. No, you weren't qualified. Yeah. And, and so at, at first, when you're an ensign, it's like, well, I can't do anything. This is no fun. I don't even get to spend my own money. But that money compounded so quickly. There's a major decision that most surface warfare officers in the U.S. Navy make, and it's right around their four or five year mark. And that is, do I want to become a department head in the surface warfare fleet? And if the department head bonuses are between $95,000 and $115,000 upon signing for three-year orders, and no one, no other community, no other aspect of the military offers six-figure bonuses, what is going on? Not even the Air Force. Not even the Air Force, not even the Navy <laughs> SEALs. What is going on? And so I started asking questions, and I paid attention to my own department heads on the ship, and I realized this is miserable. I do not want to do this. I have got to find something else to do. And so that was quite literally the discussion my husband and I had that night was I got home and I said, I do not want to be a department head. And he said, well, what do you want to do instead? I said, I don't even know what I can do right now. What can we afford to do? And so we opened up all the accounts and we started doing all the math. And that's the moment when we realized, oh, we're financially independent. Right it's there. not just that we have money. We have FU money. We never have to work ever again if we don't want to. But what do you do now? Because what do you do when you get a few money when you reach financial independence in your late 20s? It's like, oh, well, you can do whatever you want. Well, what does that mean exactly? And so then the next few years we're coming up with, well, 
Juan and I step back from the Navy full-time and start doing part-time reserve work. And then we'll start a family. And just like that, just like that. And <laughs> we look brilliant on this side of the pandemic because our daughter was born in January of 2020. And we all know what happened in March of 2020. And so it worked out beautifully that I became the stay at home parent. My husband who was in a graduate school program at the time became the study at home parent. And our daughter got all of our attention for the next 14, 15, 16 months. Yep. It was a very long pandemic. Yep. And people are worried about losing their job during the pandemic. People are worried about losing their life savings with, with staying in the hospital if they survive. People are worried about all kinds of financial. It was the recession all over again, except you were masking up, socially distanced, and not allowed to go to the mall. And we had choices. We could choose to, I mean, you had to stay at home, but we could choose to enjoy our time at home with our daughter instead of frantically trying to find another job or frantically doing some kind of delivery service to be able to make ends meet in their household. Mm -hmm. So so here we are in, in 2023, now several years removed from that, thinking, oh, thank goodness we had what we had when we did, not knowing that the 21-year-olds in us had no idea any of this was coming. But man, are we thankful those 21-year-olds saved the money while we did, because we would not have the lifestyle that we have here at 31 had we not started what we did at 21. And you did this on relatively modest incomes. I mean, our our audience is late starters. Their big question is, well, I don't make so much. How do I get there? Uh, can you give us a little bit of the financial journey of what, what were the numbers a little bit? Getting to six figures didn't happen quickly, and but getting to financial independence did. How do you reconcile those things? Did you ever get to six figures? No. No. Yeah. No. Never. I've never been paid six figures. Her, I don't think her, her spouse. Her spouse just got to six figures. At at his his ten year mark in the military career, <clears> he <throat> is now at six figures. Let's see. When I was in high school and I started working at age fourteen, I remember that the minimum wage I was paid at the time was six dollars and twenty five cents. This is two thousand six, and weeks later it got raised to six dollars and seventy five cents. By the time I graduated high school, I was being paid twelve dollars an hour in two thousand ten. And by the time I started my military career in 2014, I was making about $60,000 a year. And that includes right. the housing allowance and the food allowance and the overseas cost of living allowance. It's the total military compensation package, including all the benefits that don't mm -hmm. show up on your W-2. And and I wasn't using very much gas. I was usually riding my bicycle <laughs> to work because, again, better parking. <laughs> so not qualified. And I had no free time. I would start up my Netflix subscription for the month or two that I was in port, and then I would cancel my Netflix subscription for the six or seven months I was out at sea because you don't have internet connectivity to watch Netflix. And so I figured out along the line that I was only using about twenty to $25,000 of that paycheck, and that included rent and that included food. And so it was easy for me to stash the rest of that money. And it was making the maximum contribution I could to my thrift savings plan, my 401k. It was maxing out my Roth IRA every year. And it was even, I called it shoveling it. It was, I was taking $1,000 a month and putting it into my brokerage account on an automatic payment. And, and the next time I had internet and I could check my balances, if I had more than, I think I said $10,000 in emergency savings at the time, because that was about six months oh, yeah, for yeah. me. Yeah, emergency fund. Yeah, yeah emergency yeah. funds. I would take whatever excess over that $10,000 and I would manually add that to my brokerage account. So I'm just saving and saving and saving and saving and saving because I have no time to spend. I'm barely getting seven hours of sleep. Uh, Are you qualified yet? No, I'm still not qualified. <laughs> Now, this says more about the quality of life in the U.S. military than it does about your ability to have a high savings rate. But I, I, I tell every military family that even if you're not deployed for six months a year on sea duty where you don't have any spending choices, I tell them, just track your spending. Know where the money goes. Just give it three or four months of logging data, however you do that. And once you know where the money is going, then all, all you need to start with is just cut out the waste. And as you cut out the waste, you're going to start having a little excess money to pay off the debt. And once you get far enough out of debt, you're going to start investing in the 401k for your match. You're going to start building up your IRA. You're going to start building up your 401k balance and then saving even more taxable accounts. It's not a question of, oh, just go out and work harder and get a six-figure job. And in many cases, that's not going to happen, especially in, a, in an older catching up to FI audience, right? That, that ship might have sailed. And so you're going to do the best you can with what you have and, and figure out what's important to you so that you're not spending 
mindlessly. Instead, you're spending thoughtfully and deliberately where you can, where you can control it. And, and that's what happened in this case in sequence of returns and uh, guarantee of employability. You had very good, See, that's, you, you that's, never had to face a layoff. That's the funny thing yeah. about the military in my era was yeah. I commissioned in 2014 yeah. and anybody who's outside the military may not have remembered the great sequestration of 2013, but that was such a bad sequestration that the military is still dealing with the ramifications of it. And, and anyone who wasn't present for the original sequestration of 2013 Maybe they're in the Coast Guard, and I can't remember if it was 2018 or 2019, where the Coast Guard yeah, and TSA were not paid for several months while yeah. being required to work. I can think of at least three or four different times in my career where I was guaranteed a job, and I was obligated, required by martial law to be at my job. But I was not getting a paycheck because there was some sort of hiccup or some sort of debate on the floor in, yeah. the, in Congress yeah. or, mm -hmm. or some other reason that I was not getting paid. But you, so, you were made whole eventually. Made whole eventually, yeah. but when was eventually going to be? It was different every time. Right. Every single right. time right. it was different. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, again, more choices, more freedom. Every time it happened, we would just quietly take notes of what happened and add this to the reasons we were going to leave the military and go find a job that would actually pay. Somebody suggested that they maintain a, a running list of pros and cons of being in the military and, uh, and refer to that frequently at every uh, retention decision. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Again, it's a sequence of mindfully saving and investing, and and luck can certainly play a big part in how soon you reach financial independence. But I would also speculate that the act of paying attention to your spending, of focusing on making sure you get the value out of every dollar, will eventually lead you in a mindset where you're also focusing on improving your work skills, either doing better at work or finding a more fruitful career where you're getting paid more for the human capital that you already possess, maybe starting a side hustle. Those are the sort of things where the, the trite phrase is you make your own luck or the harder you work, the luckier you get. But that's the, the whole point is that if that happens early on in your life, then wow, suddenly you're financially independent 10 years later. Well, the good news is that if you do that sort of financial attention later in life, 10, 15 years later, you're probably going to be, if not financially secure, financially independent. Mm -hmm. And you're not even looking at Social Security. I mean, you get, Social Security is not even on your radar. I, I a, take Social Security is a whole lifetime away. What uh, are you talking I, about? I take great comfort at uh, knowing Social Security is there for me if we totally screw up all this financial independence stuff. Mm -hmm. right. and, and again, for many people that are trying to figure out the 4% safe withdrawal rate, the very first thing I tell them is, well, if it works out, it works out. And if it doesn't work, there's Social Security at the end of that. Mm -hmm. Correct. Well, this has been awesome. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Have you got any other thoughts, Bill? No, I mean, there's the, the last thought, and I would encourage people to read the book, is mm -hmm. talking about uh, estate planning and generational wealth and how do you gift your kids while they're alive as opposed to waiting for the big amount on death. And there's a lot of stuff there. We had an episode with Cameron Huddleston earlier in oh, our yeah. series. And um, we even tell Doug's story with his dad in that episode. Uh, there's a lot to know about mm -hmm. learning your parents' big number and finding out about the transparency of your finances, which I think is important at, at an age appropriate time. Uh, how much money do mom and dad have? And when is the right time to tell them? And then how do you do it in a constructive way so they can take care of, know that you're taken care of, but if you become disabled, incapacitated, or heaven forbid die, they can seamlessly take over your financial organization. Who wants to take over a cluttered house with a hoarder and have to dispose of she's, that? She's seen that in the two prior generations, right? No, she's not gonna let that happen to her. Yeah, and so it's important for parents to be organized with their finances because it's a gift you give your kids. And read this chapter in their book, find out and what it's like to divulge the big number and how you do it. There's just so much here, so many nuggets we've talked about today, and we've taken you through Carol's journey, but and our kids' journeys are all different, but there are similarities here and lessons to be learned, mistakes not to be made again. I wanna thank Doug and Carol for joining us here today. And we have a few lightning questions for you which oh, no. we've talked about your biggest mistakes and your biggest wins, but I want to know where your favorite place to surf is. 
Oh, thank God, oh, a soft oh, oh, yeah. Kalilo, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a beach that's gone through several names, Barber's Point, the White Plains, but the town that it's next to is called Kalilo, and it's on the southwest side of Oahu. Right, right over there. Yeah. I'll be there Sunday morning. And <laughs> Kalilo, White Plains Beach is a south swell, so it's uh, very good in the summer. And even in the winter, it's good enough that you can still take out a stand-up paddleboard in small waves. Nice. Second favorite place. The second favorite place is up on the North Shore in the wintertime. Pua'ena. Pua'ena, Haleiwa Beach Park. And Pua'ena's a bay in Haleiwa Bay where you paddle out there and you can catch, easily catch 10 to 15 footers anytime you want, whether you want to or not. And those two, spot, those two spots give uh, me enough reason to paddle out two, three times a week. And I'm looking forward to having some, oh, uh, yeah. some of the next generation join me there. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Nice. And my understanding is, as Becky has alluded to before, that if our FI audience or people that have come across your path, if they make it to Oahu and connect with you, you will give them a free surf lesson, right? I, I will. And and we'll, we'll work at it. This is not a challenge. If you are curious about surfing and you want to learn to surf, I, I can show you how to do that. On the other hand, if you would rather just sit somewhere and sip coffee or uh, enjoy Waikiki and watch other people surf, that's fine too. The whole point is that you uh, come out here and get a chance to enjoy Hawaii your way. And if you want to meet up and talk about financial independence and uh, the glamorous Hawaii lifestyle or, or aging, other topics like that, I'm happy to do that. Well, nice. we should have a catching up to five meetup in Hawaii, Becky, don't you think? Uh, You've been to Bali. Uh, maybe we can uh, entreat Doug to speak at a catching up to five conference in Hawaii. What do you think? Oh, I like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> it, it works for me. I mean, you can pick any month of the year. It doesn't have to be during the coldest months of the year when other people involved with catching up to FI are freezing their butts off in places like oh, I don't know, Arizona. But <laughs> you can pick a time that works for you or we can just do individual meetups. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Awesome. Oh, that's we, fun. We've had a great time today. We need to make a couple of thanks, uh, not just to Carol and Doug, but to our team. In the background, in the backstage, Diana Falk, our social media maven. We have Fritz Bossart, our virtual assistant out in the Philippines, who does all of our editing. And we have Becky's daughter, Sarah, who does uh, all of our show notes. So if there's things you'd like to see in the show notes, Doug, in order to promote your charities for veterans, et cetera, we'd like you to send us those links. We'll post them. We want to pay it forward, too. I will. Thanks again for being on the show. All right. Thank you. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five, guys. It's been great. Thank hope you guys. enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Five. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.